Good morning, everybody. Let's talk markdowns. Inevitably, markdowns, something we all deal with in retail. Yeah. So I'll wait for a second for some of you guys to pop on. But uh, one of the big questions we get asked here at the Boutique Hub all the time is markdowns. When do we take markdowns? How often should we be taking them? What discount should we be doing? How long do we let things sit on our sale floor or on our website? So today we want to just talk about some strategies and some uh, tips to help you be more profitable because uh, at the end of the day, that's what we're all here in business to do is be profitable. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Burks. I'm the Director of Partnerships and Education for the Boutique Hub. I've been with the Hub for about two and a half years now and I owned a store for many years in um, a very small rural community and uh, know what it's like to have excess inventory. I know what it's like to have the struggles of maybe overbuying for a season or underbuying for a season. And uh, yeah, good morning guys, good to see you, good to see you. So I teach retail boot camp with Ashley in the hub. I also teach uh, boutique owner basics and do a number of speaking opportunities and educational seminars and things like that for the hub. But uh, my big passion, having been a boutique owner for many years, I started back in the early 90s, my big passion is to help you guys understand how to make money in your store and find a way to turn cash faster in your store, turn your inventory faster, to make more money. Who doesn't want to make more money? Because I know one of the big things boutique owners tend to do is feel like they need to reinvest every dollar that comes into their business, back into their business, and they fail to take a paycheck. They fail to reward themselves for all the work they're doing. And anyway, it ends up for burnout, right? Um, so I want to talk to you guys today about markdowns. So I've got I've got four or five tips, and for those that you know me, um, those four or five tips. Hey John, those four or five tips are probably going to turn into six, seven, or eight because um, I'm very passionate about this. I'm very passionate about um, helping you guys and giving you guys as much information and tips as possible. So that being said, a lot of what we go over here today, I will deep dive further in in our retail boot camp course that uh, Ashley and I are launching right now. Uh, we do a 12-week retail boot camp course that is extremely in-depth in all things retail. And um, so I just want to give you kind of a, a I don't know, um, some fun, easy, quick tips uh, today. And for more information, let us know and happy to provide some of that information on how to get into retail boot camp. The course closes on Friday. So uh, anyway, very excited about that. But let's dive into markdowns. So a couple myths about markdowns is I think some people feel like if they have to take a markdown, it's a bad thing. And it's not a bad thing. Markdowns are inevitable in retail. It's going to happen. So just own it. It's not a big deal. It happens all the time. And it happens for a positive reason, right? There's a lot of things about markdowns that entices your customers to come in. It creates a little bit more excitement, moves inventory faster. So if you look at it as a negative thing, I'm going to tell you, say you've probably waited too long to take the markdowns. So number one tip, markdowns are inevitable. You're gonna take them. Knowing that up ahead, be mindful of your pricing. For all of you that are watching this that are saying to yourselves, I want to be an affordable store. I wanna be affordable for people. I want to be the next trendy, affordable online boutique. Well, guys, it costs money to make money. There's a lot of expenses in retail. Golly, you know, how many times you open the mail and you're like, crap, more bills. Just keeps, money keeps going out of your business. Well, that's inevitable too, right? It costs money to make money. So be mindful of the pricing strategy you're implementing. Make sure you're setting yourself up to win. Don't show up to the game unprepared. Don't invest in that $20 sweater and mark it up to $29. I see it happen. And, you, and the reason why people are doing it is they tell me, they're like, well, Sarah, I want, my, I want to, to sell fast. That's fine, but really, are we in the business on making $9? because that doesn't pay for anything. You already owe the, the vendor the 20 bucks, right? Plus the freight to get it there. Plus you're gonna unpack it, hang it, steam it, merchandise it, put it on the floor. Basically it's taking up rent space in your store, right? You're giving it something, whether it's on your website or on your sales floor, then you have to pay bills out of that. And don't forget, I said our main number one goal is to pay yourself because it's super important that you make money. You're not going to go work at the bank down the street or the school system or McDonald's or Walmart and just be like, oh, you know what? That's okay. You can't pay me this month. No big deal. I'll be back tomorrow and I'll be your hardest worker ever. I'll show up early and stay late. 
Yeah, no problem. I won't take a lunch. That's no problem. Yeah, no, somebody else can get my kids. Oh, I'll hire a babysitter to get my kids so I can stay late. But don't worry, don't pay me. That never happens. You guys, if that happened, you'd be gone and never come back, right? Well, why, why would this business be different? So from the get-go, set yourself up to win, right? Make sure you have the margins built in with your investments. So in, markups are inevitable, they're gonna happen. But when you go to market or you go and invest in product that you are going to turn around and sell, be mindful of what you're gonna sell it for. I talk a lot about this in Retail Bootcamp and um, I'm big on saying, okay, so I walk into this vendor booth and I like this sweater. This sweater is super cute. I think it speaks to my, my customer, all this stuff. The first question I ask, and I see Patty Durham in here watching. Patty, I know you know the answer. The first question that I'm going to ask myself is, what is my customer going to pay for that sweater? I'm asking myself, I'm asking my sales staff or whoever might have come with me, say, what do you think we can sell this sweater for? Right? If I honestly in my heart of hearts feel like that sweater is $60, as a $60 sweater, I'm going to turn that for $60. Bucks. And as a matter of fact, I can think of four customers that are going to buy that for $60. Bucks. All right? And then I asked the, the sales staff, I said, okay, the vendor, I'm like, when is that shipping? They say, well, it's shipping tomorrow, but I don't need it tomorrow. Pass. Move on. Don't fall in love with it, right? Because if you don't need it, you don't need it. I'm going to take notes on it and I'm going to reinvest in it later maybe, right? So I know that sweater in my heart of hearts. I believe I'm going to sell it for 60 bucks. I asked the vendor. The vendor says, well, actually, it's not shipping for 30 days. That is a new arrival for next month, coming out next month. I'm like, perfect. That fits into my buying plan. Next thing I'm going to do is touch, feel it, make sure it's a good quality, right? Then I'm going to ask about the size. I'm like, okay, so that says it's a medium. Is that fitting me or is that fitting my seven-year-old daughter, right? What's the medium size run, right? What are we doing here? Tell me, be very upfront and honest because if I bring in a medium that's going to fit a size 12 toddler child, sorry, it doesn't fit in my program. If he says that medium's fitting you and I usually wear a 6'8", all right, I feel good about it. So far, this shirt's winning. This sweater is winning, right? Feeling like it's a good investment. All right, so then... Have whatever other conversation you want, but the very last thing you're gonna ask that vendor or you're gonna do is you're gonna flip that sales ticket around the the and their price tag, whatever, and you're gonna look at it. And if it says that sweater's forty dollars wholesale cost, nope, not a good investment. That's not worth my time. If I see that that sweater is twenty dollars near that twenty dollar range, right there, I'm like, bingo, I'm making forty bucks on this thing. That forty dollars is gonna pay for a lot of stuff. As I already said, I feel like I have four, four customers that I know are gonna invest in it, right? I'm pretty sure, I've, I have it in my mind. And actually, when I would write the purchase order, when I'd write that up, I'd write those four customers' names right next to that style number. So when I got home, or when I was speaking with that person, wherever it was, I could say, hey, Jennifer, guess what? I saw the most amazing sweater, and it's coming in next month, and it's got your name on it. Da 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 it's the best color for you, it's the best fit, all these kind of things, okay? So that being said, that $40, what is it gonna pay for? It's gonna cost me 20, I'm gonna retail it at 60. So I've, I'm making 40 bucks there, what am I gonna pay for with that 40 bucks? The cost of the sweater, my expenses, and markdowns. Remember, markdowns are inevitable. So that 40 bucks is going to be able to absorb any markdowns that I have to later take. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've completely missed the boat on this, which happens, right? We're, we're human, trends change, weather patterns change, culture shifts, whatever it is, bad deliveries, all these kind of things happen that maybe affect why or why it didn't sell. But that 40 bucks is built in and I feel confident that that's a $60 sweater. So if there is something that happens, it doesn't sell as well, right? Say instead of selling four of those at full, full price, I sell three. I have built in some profit that can afford some markdowns. All right, mic drop on that one. Markdowns are inevitable, but you've got to price your inventory to win. Those people that are in this game that might be set up down the street from you that are hanging their hat on the fact that they're the cheapest place in town and they're the most affordable place to shop and they'll beat absolutely everybody, even the Flying J Chuck stop on a graphic tee, so be it. Let them be that person. 
They're not going to have the money to turn the lights on. They're not going to have the money to pay the staff. They're not going to have the money to pay the state. And they're going to be they're going to be here today, gone tomorrow. So don't even worry about that. Be you. Be awesome. Be the most amazing customer service store, boutique, website you possibly can be. And you're going to do that by having money to pay people, right? Because you as the owner can't be everywhere all the time. So all of that happens with your markup, right? You've got to price your product to make the money to pay for the expenses. We already know we invested the $20 to the vendor. They want their money now. And as a matter of fact, the way the world is, you probably had to put it on a credit card. So they're getting their money right away right? You have to pay for all these expenses. Guys, your government does not just want you to be in business and let you live without paying taxes. No, they will come knocking, right? It's, you have to pay your staff. You have to pay for electricity. You have to pay for the props. You have to pay for heat. You have to pay yourself. You have to pay for all of these things. So if you buy this top at 20 bucks and price it at 29, guys, you can't pay for any of it. You just can't. So tip number one, Markdowns are inevitable, but in order to make those happen, you have got to be conscious of your markup. So tip number two. So we said markups are inevitable, or I'm sorry, markdowns are inevitable. And very important to learn from the markdowns you take. If you have to take markdowns, which you will, why are you doing it? What is the chain of events that have happened that has led to that, right? Hopefully, if you implement all of these things that I talked about when you go to market and you purchase or you go online and you're buying, hopefully you're reducing these buying mistakes that you're making. Hopefully you're reducing these um, errors that you're making in delivery times, errors that you're making in quality, errors that you're making in fit. Hopefully you're reducing that. I'm not saying it's going to go away, but hopefully you're reducing that because I know one of the biggest buying mistakes a lot of boutique owners do is they fall in love with the product too soon. They look at it. They think it's cute. They think, oh my gosh, I saw that someplace else. My customers are going to want it. I'm buying it. They put it in the cart. They say yes to the dress. Next thing you know is it shows up and it fits a junior size person or it's got some big graphic on the back of it they did not know, right? That happens. So hopefully if you're implementing a number of those tips I said earlier, this won't happen as much, but let's be real. You're gonna end up with sale merchandise. You're gonna end up with stuff that's not moving. No big deal, but just learn from it. Is it the wrong fit? Is it the wrong size, right? Is it like, did you get it in plus? Should you have gotten it in junior? Or did you get it in junior or missing? You should have gotten it in plus. Is the vendor not shipping you when they said they were going to? Did you tell them you need it the 1st of February and all of a sudden, it showed up the end of March or it showed up in January. But getting it in too early or too late, you know, that's a, that there's a window of opportunity there. Did you miss it? Right. Um, was the fabric not right? You know, a lot of people are very texture driven and I, I am that person. You know, is there a something flawed with the material? Is there something flawed with the fit? Um, did you have it in really bad place on your website or really bad place on your on your store floor? Did you get complacent and lazy in selling it? How about features and functions and value? You might know it. This is another thing, a little side tip to tip number two. But when you were at market and the brand or the vendor guy told you how awesome this product was and why it was going to fly off your shelves and the features and functions of this, and that was great, and you got excited and you thought it was the coolest thing ever, when you got back and UPS dropped it off at your store, did you explain that to your staff? Do you, do they know that there's a hidden wedge in that boot? Do they know that those, um, that the waistline has a tummy control in it? Do they know that this fabric is um, wicking or breathable or all these kind of things? Do they know that? They probably don't if you didn't tell them. You know why? Because that girl was at school all day studying for finals. She came here, she still got finals on her brain and she's gonna do her best to sell to your, your customers, but she wasn't living in the world of studying that that item at market. She didn't walk the store floor or the sales floor at Magic or at Win and be enticed and excited about all the trends and fashions happening. She's not getting all the publications and reading about forecasting and trends and what the world is doing in fashion. Nor is the stay at home mom that's been changing baby's diapers all week that comes to your store to work for four hours, right? You are the one with the knowledge as the store owner or the manager. I hope you're passing that on to your customer, your staff so they can pass it on to your customers. So a lot of times when you have to move markdowns, it's because 
you haven't stayed excited about the product, your staff hasn't stayed excited about the product, or your staff's not really even sure how to communicate products to your customers. I'm gonna give you an example of, um, there's these, uh, and they're still on the market, I still see them. Uh, they're these vests that you can weigh, wear multiple different ways, right? You can wear them with, so they're long, they're um, like almost like a scarf material. You can wear them so they're long, more like a tunic type uh, vest. You can flip them upside down and wear them so they're more of a cropped vest, so they have the long tails in the front, right? You can wear them as a scarf. You could actually take them and loop the excess fabric through the armholes and wear them as a scarf. And you can also wear them as a poncho, right? So the armhole goes over your neck and then the one side drapes down your arm. Hopefully you guys are getting a visual, right? So that's like four ways right away that you can wear this. And we would price these at $19.95. They would just roll out the store. Well, here's the thing. I went to market, saw these things, fell in love with them. Like, oh my gosh, these are gonna be awesome. I got a great markup on them. My customers are gonna love them. Perfect, shawl dolls. Absolutely, Patty, you know what I'm saying. Well, error by my part, I wasn't there the day that they showed up at the store, right? So my sales staff opens, opens them up, looks at them, thinks they're best, they've got two armholes, they put them on hangers, they hang them on a rack somewhere, and that's it. Time goes by, time goes by. I am selling them one day, and one of my sales clerks sees me and she's like, I had no idea those things were wear three or four ways. And I said, well, how did you not know that? And she goes, I don't know, they just look like a vest. Well, if they look like a vest to my manager who worked 35 to 40 hours a week, guess what they look like to my customers that she waited on? A vest. But they were so much more than that. As soon as we did some education with our staff and told our staff what those products were, guys, we were ordering those things night and day. They were flying out of the store. Whose fault is that? That was mine. It was 100% on me because I didn't do the education with my staff so they could educate my customers. So, end result, those vests were gonna sit there and age and die on my sales floor, right? And probably what was gonna end up happening is I was gonna get irritated they were still there, and if I'm a complacent, just kinda more, I would say lazy, I would be like, eh, put them on sale. Just put them on sale. Well, with no, no idea really what they were, were they gonna sell better on sale? No, they weren't. So, tip number two, why are you not moving your product? Why are you having to take these markdowns? Um, I once went to a conference um, in, in Michigan. It was um, whiz-bang training, that's what it was. And um, Bob Negan said, every markdown you take is your tuition, your college tuition on retail. It's what you're investing in learning, the expense you're taking to learn about your products and learn about your customers. There's Kim Brandenville. She owns a few of those vests that I was just talking about. Hey, Kim. So guys, that's a big one. Learn from your markdowns. Why is it not moving? Tip number three, your inventory is not fine wine. It is not gonna get better with age. As a matter of fact, we've all seen those crop sweaters grow to tunic sweaters on your hangers, right? We've all seen them grow, change colors, whatever it is. They don't get better with age. So if you're gonna take markdowns, be aggressive in it. Notice, be aggressive in walking your sales floor, looking at your aging reports, all these kind of things. No, I have this much money tied up in merchandise. I have this much money tied up in shoes. I need to get these things gone. They are not gonna look better next season. They're not gonna look better in six weeks. That leads me to, um, I'm gonna just jump in here with tip four on blanket sales. A lot of times people in or store owners feel like, well, gosh, I need to make money and I need to make money now. I've got end of the month coming up. I've gotta make payroll, pay all my bills, all these kind of things. Let's just run a big blanket sale. Well guys, the problem with that is UPS might have just dropped off $4,000 worth of, of items at your store yesterday, right? And that's great. However, if you're gonna run a blanket sale, your customers are gonna run in and buy all that brand new stuff that you just put on sale. And that's not what you wanna do. So sales or markdowns are when you take a, take a reduced price and it's not gonna go back up, right? It's not, it's not like you are running a promotion. A promotion is something maybe you're running a reduced price on something for a short period of time to generate excitement, to get somebody to come in and look at maybe a new line or new types of products or whatever you're running, right? Like maybe you're introducing a new type of jean into your store, denim jean, and you want more customers to try it on. So you might run a promotion, a short-term promotion on that. But what we're talking about is sales and markdowns, where those you're gonna take that $69 pair of jeans and price it down to make it move at say $39 because 
you got to get that thing gone. You're not going to mark it ever back up. It's never going to go back up to that original 69. So just so we're all on the same page on pricing, on promotions, sales, and markdowns, what the difference between a sale and a promotion is. But my thing about blanket sales is basically you're giving away the farm and the cow and the wife and the whole deal. And you don't want to do that. You want to make sure you're enticing people to come in and get the stuff that you need gone, the stuff that's aging, that's starting to grow on the hanger, that is reaching that life cycle. It's, it's peaking, it's about to drop. And that's something we dive deep into in Retail Bootcamp um, as far as understanding the life cycle of your product and how your inventory ages, right? And getting the most out of that inventory throughout that process. So. Your inventory is not gonna get any better with time. So being aggressive, and it's so much better, honestly, to get the money earlier than it is to hold on to it to maybe make a little bit more money later. Here's my thing. If you say that, if I'm, we're walking the sales floor, I'm a big one about managing by walking around. That is um, a huge, huge thing. I feel like that is a big win for all of us as store owners or managers. If we're walking around, we're visible, we're in our store, we see what's going on. I see this product that it's my aging report has told me because I entered it into my point of sale. This is a whole nother training, but I entered it into my point of sale when I received it January 1. Now, I run that aging report. I look and I see, oh my gosh, I have $10,000 worth of shoes that are still sitting there that's been here since, say, January 1st. So I need to make a move on those. Those have not moved. Out of all of that inventory, I've maybe sold a couple pair in 27 days, 26 days, whatever it is. Okay, I need to start making a move because we're approaching that 30-day mark. Learn from it. Is it bad placement in your store? Are the prices wrong, right? Are my sales staff don't understand what it is. We talked about that already. So once I make a decision about that and I think, okay, I have got to start moving these products. Is it better to take a 10% off sale on those now? Or is it better if I honestly feel like this was a buying mistake, nobody's interested in them, all these kind of things, and I need to get aggressive is that 20 or 25% off better? Will that make something move? My tip on markdowns is it is better to get it gone now than it is to hope that it's gonna sell later, reinvest more time, energy, and money into it for an extended period of time, only to maybe move it um, at 60 or 70% off in three months. Does that make sense? So my thing about that is a lot of store owners fall in love with their product, they don't put it on markdown, they don't move it, they don't re-merchandise it, they don't re-photo it, they don't do anything with it, and then what they end up doing is taking some huge markdown on it later. So with those markdowns, take notice of your day, of your how long the inventory has been there. How, how long has it lived in your store? Uh, we talk about, um, I, I don't know exactly who told me this, but um, Ashley and I were at a seminar one time. I think it was Management One, actually. And they were talking about inventory. When it arrives in your store, it's like a box of bananas, right? And you rip off that tape as soon as the UPS driver drops it in your store. You rip off that tape of bananas. In the banana box is green bananas. It's exposed to the air, which means it's now becoming alive in your store. Those bananas instantly turn yellow. Everybody wants yellow bananas, right? You bring it out onto your sales floor and it's, they start to turn black and they turn black very, very quickly. So what I'm telling you is your inventory has a life cycle in your store and you have got to understand that. And everybody's a little different, but if you don't look and notice how much inventory you have on hand and try to take those markdowns early to generate that sale, you're gonna tie up a lot more dollars and a lot more floor space, a lot more website space, all these kind of things on inventory that I guarantee you, you're losing energy in, you're losing excitement in, so is your staff, okay? So, let's see, I tend to want to take a markdown mostly only when it's the end of season. And that, I understand that, Patty, but sometimes through, and I, I think that's great, end of season stuff, yes, you've gotta make a move, but when is end of season? When is end of season for you versus when is end of season for your customers? Be very mindful of that because a lot of times we have um, we have winter stores that say end of season for in Wisconsin. They want to say end of season in Wisconsin is when people really start wearing warm clothes. That's not the case. People want warmer or uh, summer clothes earlier in the year. Yes, they might buy winter clothes after Christmas, but they're not going to pay full price for it. 
When was the last time you went out in February and paid full price for a winter sweater that had been hanging on the rack since September the, of the year prior? You don't. As a customer, you don't. Christmas hits, that's over, and I'm thinking beaches, camping, picnics, rodeos. I'm thinking all those kind of warm weather things, right? Because my mind is moved on to the next thing. We are so far in advance as consumers that our, our purchases go with that. So for a store owner to hang on to all of their winter stuff until late into January, late into February, even into March, it's too late. You've missed that window. So even if you're trying to give that stuff away, your customers are moved on, right? So what I'm saying is it's, it's better to even in December, some of that, that winter stuff in December that hasn't moved and you know it's, it's, it, it's aging there, start enticing your customer with a markdown. Be aggressive there. Don't be complacent because the last thing you want to do is try to re-flip your store, flip that merchandise in say March and really be introducing that spring and summer good. And next thing you know, you're telling yourself, I need to order more hangers. No, you don't. You don't need to order more hangers. Don't order more hangers. Get the old stuff gone and you should have been aggressive with it earlier. The order more hangers thing really gets under my skin because I see people post in the boutique hub all the time. I'm running out of space. I've taken over my garage. I've taken over my, my spare bedroom. I, all these kind of things. I need more hangers. No, you don't. You need to get aggressive in moving out that stuff, turning it into cash so you can pay your bills. Tur inventory turn is a whole nother thing. And obviously I get pretty excited about talking about it. But it all goes back to understanding your inventory life cycle and taking those markdowns and taking them early. If you are running out of cash, I guarantee you it's hanging in your store. Keep in mind that so many times people are like, well, I need to order more merchandise, but I don't have any money. Or I need to do this, but I don't have any money. You have money. It's hanging in your store or in your warehouse. It's hanging on, the, on all those hangers. There's $20 bills on every one of those hangers just taunting you. Now it's up to you to figure out a way to get that to change from hanging on a hanger to in your bank account so you can use it, right? Because you can't spend inventory. You're not gonna go to the travel agent and say, hey, I'd like to go on a spring break vacation. Here's a box of inventory. No, you're not gonna go back to the bank and say, hey, I'd like to pay down on my loan. Here's a box of inventory. Absolutely not. They only take cash. Cash is king. Cash is what pays bills. So you got to figure out a way to turn the inventory that you have into cash. Okay, I'm the worst about hangers, so thank you. Oh my god. <laughs> oh man, you're not the only one, Chancy. I see it all the time. I I see it all the time. Oh, you inventory turn, you guys, I could go on and on and on about this and understanding like what is your goal to sell, how fast do you sell your products throughout the year, how much inventory do you need to have on hand at a specific time to make your sales. That is retail boot camp. So I won't go into that because we'd be here for two more hours talk, just talking about that. But I get really impassioned about that because so often we find ourselves in a crunch of cash and we just don't know what to do and we're kind of got our hands are on our neck because we we just can't do anything because we don't have any more cash but yet there it is it's hanging there in our stores or in our warehouse just sitting there so taking those markdowns being aggressive with those markdowns it all goes back to all the all these tips that I brought up already this morning so let's see how do you handle customers who follow your markdowns okay so this is this was thank you for reminding me of that. So in tip number two, where I said learn from your markdowns, here's another big thing I beg you to do. Educate your customers on why you're taking the markdowns. If you get in the habit of educating your customers that you're having to take a markdown because say we're moving this out, we ordered too much, or this came in at the wrong time, or I think we're ahead of trend here, whatever it is, that really helps for them not to assume that you're constantly marking items down right? And they start to see a trend. Is it going to happen overnight? No, it's not. It's not going to happen overnight. It is going to happen over time. But I guarantee you, I forget Annie, I think Annie was the one that asked this. If you have a run of jeans that you're sitting on, and Annie, you come in the store, and I think these jeans are going to be awesome for you. I might say, hey, Annie, would you mind trying these jeans on? I think they're a little ahead of trend for our area. I saw them everywhere in Vegas. I've seen them everywhere in Chicago. These things are gonna be big here, but I feel like we're a little ahead of trend. I'm about to maybe put these on sale just to kind of get a little excitement going on on them. 
Would you mind trying them on and let me know what you think? Annie comes out, Annie looks like a million bucks. Awesome. What I'm saying is having that conversation, one, it gets the customer engaged, two, it also helps them understand your business, what you're doing and why you're putting something on sale that it's not crappy, right? It helps them understand that you're not putting things on sale all of the time. You put things on sale for a reason. So I'm a big one on educating yourself on why you're taking markdowns and educating your customer on why you're taking markdowns. Maybe it is that you just need to completely clear out your inventory to make room for new goods. That's, that's a legit reason. If that's what it is, let them know that. Let them know there's things to get excited about, things coming in, but to just put up a sign that says 20% off that doesn't do anything. It does, especially if you're somebody like, um, oh my gosh, who was that store? Justice, my daughter's Justice. And I would, oh, I would avoid that place at all costs because it would drive me crazy knowing that everything was marked up an additional, oh my gosh, they would get stuff in for six bucks, sell it for 65 and then say, oh, it's 40% off today. No, it isn't. It isn't, girls, I get it. I, I'm, I'm not buying into that system. They haven't taken those red 40% off tags down since y'all were toddlers, so we're not doing that. That is something to avoid. How to avoid doing that with your customers is just don't run those sales all the time. Avoid the blanket sales, right? Avoid those lazy, easy, just put up a sale sign sales. Okay, somebody said, what discounts do you start with? Well, that really depends. What is gonna make the product move? That is my, my tip to you. If you think your customers are, are the type of customers that get excited about a 10% off sale, and that's gonna make them aggressive, like wanna, wanna buy that thing, and it's gonna turn that into cash for you today, right now, okay, I'll, I'll try it, 10% off, see how it goes. If you think that that product is sitting here and it is nobody's gonna get it unless I put it at 40% off, 40% off today, take your money to the bank, wash your hands of it, become a better buyer next time. Guys, it's inevitable, don't worry about it. The thing is, cash is king, you need it and you need it now. If you made a mistake, just own it, don't worry about it. That stuff's never gonna look better than it does today, right? I say it's never gonna look better than it does today. If you've done your due diligence, you've re-merchandised it, you've re-photographed it, you've moved it around in your store and everybody's educated and everybody gets it. If you've done those things, and it's still sitting there, then Sarah, you made a really bad mistake at buying it. Don't buy from them again. Make sure you write that down in your Boutique Boss Planner and you made note of that and everybody in your sales floor knows about it. So when you guys do go to market, you avoid that place. You don't go back and buy that same run. You don't buy that same cut. You don't buy from maybe that same vendor. You don't, you stay away from maybe that color or whatever it is. Learn from those things, okay? Last tip, tip number five. I don't even know what time it is. Um, tip, hi, Harley. Um, tip number five, reporting. If you don't have a point of sale system, if you don't have a point of sale system to keep up with these kind of things, please invest in one. Notice I use the word investing. A point of sale system is an investment into your business. It's not an expense. Guys, it will pay you back tenfold. It is something that's gonna win your life back. It's gonna win your hours back in your work week. You're going to be able to make much better sound investment decisions by knowing what is selling, when it's selling, who's buying it, at what discount, who, what sales staff is selling, what's being sold and then returned, right? I love my point of sales, a point of, good point of sales system because it has all of that reporting capability right there for you. A lot of you guys are using Shopify and Shopify only. There's a lot of restrictions there. I will tell you that I've talked to a couple Shopify people within the company and they are coming out with a very robust point of sale system, not just their Shopify POS, I mean a robust POS, POS system, um, but it's not gonna happen for a while. It's in the works. But uh, what point of sales would I recommend? You guys, I'm a big believer in Springboard. I like Lightspeed, I like Retail Edge, I like Celerant. If you are a Shopify user only, I also like uh, Delirious Profit as an app to add on and Shopmentory, an inventory planner. Here's my thing with apps. Sometimes they can get really expensive. They can get really, really expensive. And at the end of the year, when you start adding up all those monthly app expenses, you might've been better off investing in a good point of sale system to begin with. 
Uh, Patty, you use Springboard and love it. I love the reporting features of Springboard. Here's the beauty of a lot of these point of sale systems. Not all of them, do your shopping around, do the tutorials, watch through the videos, all these kind of things, to the tours. A lot of these point of sale systems sync up with your Shopify site, if you're e-commerce for Shopify. And a lot of them sync up with QuickBooks, which is a whole nother point. Um, I, you know, I'm not gonna talk about QuickBooks today and bookkeeping, but that was my live video a couple weeks ago. Huge, huge believer in the fact that simplifying your life by systems that work together Win back your week. You, instead of being at the store every night till eight o'clock, punching numbers, running reports, and trying to analyze these things on your homemade Excel sheet, that's probably wrong. You are able to input the data once and analyze it forever. So, big, big believer in the reporting systems. Um, there is something out there in vendor world called Net30, Net60. There used to really be something called Net90, but I, I don't even know if that exists anymore. I haven't heard or seen anybody that does that. But when you go into that vendor booth, ask. All they can say is no, is do they use terms? Can you pay on a net 30 or net 60 day dating cycle? Or do they have to have a credit card? Guilty of Excel. And, and that's fine. Everybody starts out somewhere and it's just the bigger you get, the bigger your problems, the bigger your business. So investing in a system that's gonna grow with you, Chancy, I think is huge. Because let's be honest, Chancey, you're not gonna be the same place in six months that you are today. You're not gonna be the same place in five years that you are today, right? Okay, so what I was saying about that net 30, net 60, understanding these reporting options and understanding um, the capabilities to uh, ask for extra dating is going to help you keep that cash flowing. It's gonna help you keep um, inventory coming in and you have an extra 30 or extra 60 days to pay for these things. That's beautiful because your goal in your store is to turn inventory three or four times a year, right? I, I know some of you guys are not turning inventory that fast, but that's a goal, right? And we're working through things and that's what like our course retail bootcamp and best year yet challenge and all these kind of things that we're doing. We are working on trying to get you to be more profitable in your business, right? And understanding cash is king. So cash works for you when it's cash. When cash is turned into inventory, there's, it's gotta be turned back into cash before it can work for you, right? So uh, let's see, FAIR does net 90 every once in a while and they put, okay, Angie, I love it. If you can find some resources that are gonna help you win, invest in those. When you have these vendor conversations and they wanna ship it to you tomorrow and they want your credit card and they're gonna do what they wanna do, no, put the power back in your hands. You're the boutique owner. There's, how many booths are there at Magic when we go there in two weeks? thousands, thousands, and they want your money. So shop around. Make sure you're putting yourself in the best position financially to be able to serve your customer, right? Everybody says, oh, I want the most affordable thing to pass that savings on down to my customer. Okay, fine. Then get busy and go shop around for it. Don't walk into the first vendor booth you find at Magic and just drop six grand and be like, well, there it is. Sorry, customers, that's what I got. It doesn't work that way. All right, if we just signed up, where can we get a planner? Oh, so I can drop the link for the Boutique Boss Planner right here. Um, you can go to the Boutique Hub website, theboutiquehub.com. Um, you can go there and go to our Boutique Boss store and it's there and the planner's right there. Um, but I can also drop the link for you here too. So yeah, it's awesome. We have a, in the planner, there's all sorts of places for you to talk about your best ROI on vendors, classifications, everything. Help help you go to market and become the best investor of your time and energy and money. I love it. I love it. And that's why we built the planner, right? We built the planner so you'd have everything all in one spot. Let me pull this out. I mean, mine's just got all sorts of notes and stuff on it today. But um, for those of you guys who have not seen it, this bad boy, this is huge. Gosh, there's so much good stuff in here. Inventory tracking sheets, customer information, yeah, um, stuff about your staff, how to track your staff, reminders in here about tips and tricks throughout the quarter, um, throughout the year, things that you might not remember you were supposed to be doing. You know, it gives you a heads up and reminders to say, hey, have a team meeting soon. Hey, take a couple customers out to lunch, send some thank yous, those kind of things. Uh, tips on making sure your bookkeeping is in order. Tips on what type of deductions you can take at tax time, right? How to, how to organize and plan for all those kind of things. 
There are um, tips in here from our major markets that also um, sponsor this. So like uh, Dallas Market Center, Atlanta, Las Vegas. Um, there's tips on, from them on going to market along with some little extras. There's all sorts of ideas in here for self-reflection and motivation. And remember where I talked about that markup and your markup strategy? There's places in here to track your maintained markup, what you are actually profiting. I love it. Somebody calls this your boutique Bible. I think that's a good idea. I think that's good. Uh, let's see, did I cover everything I wanted to cover? Tip number one, mark out, markdowns are inevitable, right? We're gonna have them, that's it. Don't, don't fuss about it, but be mindful of your pricing strategy. Be mindful of making sure you're able to afford the cost of the item, your expenses, that means you, paying you, and the markdowns, because you're gonna take them, right? Let's see, what did we say? Rather grab my planner and stuffed it in my bag before I left for Atlanta. I love it, awesome. Yes, take it everywhere you go, Angie, everywhere you go. Uh, let's see, so tip number one, they're inevitable. Watch your markup, make sure you're pricing yourself to win, right? Setting yourself up to succeed. Tip number two, learn from your mistakes. If you are taking markdowns, which you will, learn from them. Why am I doing it? Bad cut, bad fabric, bad vendor, bad delivery, bad store placement, bad website placement. Maybe my staff's not into it. Maybe I didn't educate them on the features and the functions of the product, whatever it was. Why is it not selling? Because here at Market, I thought this was a game changer. I thought I was gonna blow this out of the water, right? Now all of a sudden, the stuff's been here. It's been here 60 days. It's starting to age and grow on my hangers, taking up excellent retail space, real estate space, let's say that, in your store, on your website that could be generating more cash, but it's not. Why? Why is it not generating more cash? So learning from those mistakes and then also educating that customer that, hey, I'm having to take, I'm taking a markdown on this. We don't usually run markdowns, but this is a special. I'm moving this out, no longer carrying this, whatever it is, it's end of season. Um, how about this? Hey, I'm taking a markdown on this because the majority of our staff, our customers, they're not in, they don't buy this color. I thought this was gonna be a great color, but Sarah, this customer is gonna look awesome, or this color is gonna look awesome on you. Yeah, it does. It looks great on you, Sarah. You're the only one that can wear this color. You're just the bomb, da da whatever it is. Next thing you know, Sarah's rolling out of the store with that item. Be a salesperson, right? Be a salesperson. Let's see. Uh, somebody said, how do you replan markdowns? How do you replan markdowns? So basically, um, I love the inventory reporting, my aging reports, every, knowing exactly what I have that's old, how long it's been here. I also like knowing when you, something else your reporting system is gonna tell you, and that was my tip five, is are items moving out? Are they being sold? But are they coming back? We don't wanna see stuff come back, right? If it's coming back, customers weren't satisfied with it. Again, why weren't they satisfied with it? Odds are that thing's gonna end up getting put on sale somewhere. Why? So my markdown plan is knowing your inventory, running those reports, understanding how long it's been there, understanding what it's, what, what it's doing or what it's not doing for your customers. Why is it still sitting there? And then being aggressive. What is it gonna take to move this product? Does your, your customer relate to a 10% off sale? Very, very rarely does that even work, right? Take your aggressive markdowns, get it out and get it out now and just wash your hands of it and take that money to the bank and reinvest it somewhere else. So do I have a recipe for success? Is there a golden calf in this deal? No, there is not. But it's all up to you and Jackie. I don't know your customer, but maybe your customer resonates and gets excited about 20% off. But Jackie, in case you missed this, never, ever, ever do blanket sales. And that was my tip four. No blanket sales. Because if you do a blanket sale, that does educate your customer and tell them, look, hey, just hold on. The whole place is gonna be on sale, right? If you do blanket sales, your customer is going to assume you're always doing them, right? And if you do blanket sales, whatever you really wanna move, those items that you wanna get gone, nobody notices those. They somehow have this like radar, they come do 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 ooh, new arrivals, go in there. That's 20% off today, because she's doing a blanket sale. That's the stuff I'm getting. They just bypass that stuff over there that you just dusted off because it's so old in your store, right? So if you want, oh my gosh, I could go, we go into this so deep in boutique boot, or retail boot camp, but I will tell you one thing. You need those sale customers. Guys, you need them. 
Ashley did a big talk yesterday about um, segmented marketing, and we talk a lot about this. Knowing who you're contacting for different things and segmenting for different events and products and promotions and sales and all these kind of things, you need that sales customer. You need that customer that just like, she gets super excited about the big sale, the big discount. Market to her, right? You don't want to market to your customer that wants it as soon as it comes off the UPS truck when you're running a 50% off sale. That, that's not that customer's vibe. She doesn't want to go to the to coffee or to wine and brag about the fact that she got this item at 50% off. Now, that lady that's driving that fancy, huge SUV that looks like a million dollars all the time, most of the time, that lady wants the stuff now before anybody else is getting it, right? And I, I don't want to like profile people, but you guys, you have got to segment your list. You've got to understand who your buyers are, and there is a buyer for that $5 rack you've got sitting in the corner in your store. Go find them, market to them, get that crap out of there, and go invest that money somewhere else. Uh, let's see. So inevitable, markdowns are inevitable, learn from them. Inventory does not get better with age. So uh, Jackie, markdown plan, get aggressive with it, right? If it's not moving, why is it not moving? What am I gonna do to get it out of here right now? Immediately. Because you know those spring orders are coming. Those spring orders are coming and if you don't have hangers for them, you better find hangers for them. And I don't mean by calling store supply warehouse and getting more hangers. No, I mean, and I don't mean by taking stuff off a hanger and folding it on the table either. No, sell your stuff. Your inventory is cash. It's tied up right there. It is tied up, hanging on hangers. You gotta turn it into cash quickly, right? Cash is king. I mean, really, it's only 25% off. What was the question? Buy one, get one half shoes. They know I'm a shoe fanatic and they know I don't want to put them on sale. If, if, if your customer resonates with that, buy one, get one half off shoe sale, perfect. If your markup has supported it, Angie, I think you're in good shape. If your markup supports that markdown, awesome. If your markup supports that, that markup, if your markup supports that markdown, the expenses that you're paying and the cost of the item and you still have money left over, perfect. That's your goal, that is your goal. So yes, getting old inventory out. If you're still sitting on fall sweaters, if you're still sitting on um, items that came in in August, make a plan. Make a very aggressive plan because you're running out of time. My tip for you right now is to get up after this video, go take an assessment of your inventory. If you don't have, if you don't have um, inventory reporting that is able to say exactly how old your inventory is, if you don't have a ticketing system where you're actually able to look at this, the sales tag and see, oh my God, I got this in the ninth month. That was September, that was a while ago. Whatever it is, own your inventory, assess it and make a plan. Move your inventory to a, a better area, re-merchandise it, re-photograph it, have your sales staff wear it, right? Maybe if it's this new arrival thing or um, this new trend up and coming, whatever it is that your customers haven't bought into yet, call in one of your customers and say, hey, I'm giving this to you because I, I know you like it. I know you'll love it. You'll sell it. Tell me about it. Wear it home. Tell me, tell me what you think. Next thing you know, that lady goes to coffee. She's picking up her kids from school and she's bragging about this item that she got that she loves because the fit's awesome, all these kind of things. But some things don't have hanger appeal. Some things look horrible on a hanger until you get them on, right? Whatever it is, be aggressive because that stuff is not gonna sell on its own. Okay, what time frame to allow a sale or promotion to run? That really depends too, but don't be running, do not be the store owner that has the exact same things on the sidewalk in May that's still sitting there in August, right? Understand in your markdowns, you, you need to take an aggressive markdown and less is more. Again, not the blanket sale, less is more. Give them what they need, right? Entice and draw them to a specific area, last chance rack, the onesie rack, whatever it is, maybe it's a collection that you're putting on sale for a limited time. Let them know, and guys, I've done this before. I've pulled inventory in the back and it's like, nope, it's all gone. It's all gone. All that, you know, that sales stuff is all gone. I've got one thing left here that I've ended up putting on the $75 or 75% off rack, whatever it is. Fear of missing out, that FOMO, that's a big, big thing. 
Scarcity is a big thing. If your sales rack starts off as one rounder and it grows to six rounders, you've got too much sales stuff, right? At that point, you do really need to go back and say, were well, my markdown's not high enough, right? Was I giving them too many options for sale items to begin with? Is my marketing plan not right? Like I said, there's no true win all the time for everybody. Everybody's stores are different. My big question to you is ask yourself what's going on. Ask your sales staff. If you're the manager or store owner that spends the majority of their time in their back office and is not on the sales staff or the sales floor making the sales, not um, looking at Google Analytics or I'm sorry, your website analytics to see what pages people are going to, where they're dropping off, all these kind of things, find the people that do know this information. Go ask your sales staff, say, What's happening? Why is people? Why are people not buying this? Maybe they're saying, well, they touch it and then they move on. Okay, maybe that's a feel thing. Maybe they're like, well, I don't know. I've never seen anybody go over to the left side of my store before. I've never seen anybody go to that table display before that's sitting over in the left corner. Well, hello. Maybe that's bad placement. Maybe that left side of your store is just a dead zone, which for most people it is. Nobody really goes left. This is a whole nother training, merchandising. Most people come in and stay to the right. They maneuver through a store going to the right. They do not come in and go left. It's like uncomfortable or something. So do I have a true foolproof plan on markdowns? No, however, it starts back with that buying. It starts back with a nice flow of inventory. Less is more, having way too many options is overwhelming. You don't wanna be a TJ Maxx. You don't want people to have to dig, right? Introducing sale items, your markdowns, often, a little bit here and there, move that product out, add more to it. That's where I've had success and I've seen stores have success, right? But if you just say, I need to make cash, it's almost the end of the month of January and I need to pay, make payroll and you put the whole store on sale, guys, you're still gonna be ending up having all the old stuff. You're just gonna sell the new stuff. We are children's and I have Christmas to move good bit. It's at 60% off and it's not moving so much. Okay, so Ronnie, I would ask you, Christmas stuff, does it have Christmas on it? If it has Christmas on it, are you buying Christmas now at the end of January? If you're not, if, if that's not your customer, your customer is not interested in Christmas, I don't know how much you have. And I, I'm just saying, does it say Christmas on it? Like, does it have the Hallmark stuff, the trees? Does it have, say ho, ho, ho? Is it specific something that is Christmas? Here's my thought. If it is, one thing you can do is pull it back and reintroduce it next year. You could reintroduce it and introduce it next August, September as a promo, right? but it's taking up space, it's dragging your morale down. Every time you look at it, you get ticked off. Every time your sales staff looked at it, they're like, oh my God, I don't wanna sell a Santa sweater in February. They don't wanna sell it. Your customer probably doesn't really wanna see it, right? So get it out of there. And if you have to do that, if it's gonna be valuable next fall and you're gonna buy the same stuff in to sell to your customers next fall, I don't like to get in the habit of doing this but box it up, bag it up, make sure no moths are gonna get into it or wherever you can put it and write down in your Boutique Boss Planner, come August 1st, get that stuff out, make it new again, introduce it as Christmas then. That's my tip. Guys, morale is a big thing. Energy in your store is a big thing. Some people have it, some people don't, but selling Christmas stuff that actually says ho 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 or Santa Claus on it in February is a that is a drain of morale and excitement right there because people have moved on. People have way moved on and it does damage to your store if that's what you're showing. Okay, um, you wanna be, I don't know what your mission statement is, Ronnie, but I'm guessing it is something to do with being fashionable, something to do with trendy, something to do with serving a need for your customers, something to do with being an exciting um, place to fun, come find fun fashions. Nothing about selling a Christmas sweater in February works into that mission statement. So I mean that, I don't mean that negatively at all because we are all guilty of doing those kind of things. I really appreciate that question. Um, so what I would do is make that stuff disappear. And I would tell all my customers we sold out of all of our Christmas stuff. I hope that answers your question. 
All right, last time I tried to answer these questions, my video ended, so I'm gonna try not to hit anything that, my phone's so touchy. Um, let's see. All right. I think that's a good idea. The same does I put some of mine back for next year if it's still good. I yes, 100%. Um, is it, okay, I think that's everything. I mainly have maxi dresses. Most of my items are for plus size. I cater to plus size. I need to figure out a way to move. This is where when I hit more last time is where my system, my phone shut off. One thing I would say about plus size guys, um, I'm big believer in this and I've talked to a lot of stores about this and, and this gets into merchandising and I, um, I don't want to drift away from our whole plan on markdowns, but um, think like the customer in everything you do. Does the customer want Santa stuff right now? Probably not. Does the plus size customer want to have to go to an area that is labeled plus size, curvy person, whatever it is? No, they don't. <clears throat> they don't. They want to go and they want to be able to see themselves in things everybody else is wearing too, right? So a tip for that is if you're trying to separate or locate or make it easy to find for your plus size customers is from Source by Warehouse or any of those store supply areas, you can get those little um, white tabs that go on the hangers that just go right on the hanger. So when all your items are hung on a hanger in your store, you see anything with a white tab that's size 14, 16, 18, that's 1X, 2X, 3X, or maybe it's extra large up to 3X, whatever it is, and you can communicate that back to your customer. So therefore, your customer that is plus size, when she sees items in a store, she sees the collection, she sees the environment, she sees the excitement of that same table display that the size 2468 girl is seeing, and merchandise with the scarf, and with the hat, and with the fun boots, and all that kind of stuff. The plus size girls section is not shoved over in a corner all by themselves with this big neon sign that's like, plus size, no. that's an, Nobody wants that. Bring that stuff out and merchandise it together, right? Because the same plus size girl is gonna wear the scarf and gonna wear the shoes and wants to wear the necklace and wants to wear the earrings. So please just put it together in a story setting for her that she can get excited and feel good about, right? So I'm not a big, um, the, somebody is messaging the black hangers for regular size and pink hangers for curvy. Here's my thing about that, guys. Now, all of a sudden, you're spending a lot of money on different colored hangers. If you have that system going right now, great, but what do you do when you get a, a shipment in and all of a sudden, you've got 10 plus size things that need pink hangers? What do you, get when, what do, you do when you have an orange item that has to go on a pink hanger? I'm not a big fan of those things because I feel like it makes, makes it very not not very aesthetically pleasing in your store and plus it limits you and plus it spends extra money so if you can invest in those little tabs honestly i think you get like a thousand of them for five bucks have them in a little box next to where you um unbox your inventory if it's plus size it gets a white tab if you pull out a hanger that has a white tab on it and it's going on a size six item pull off the white tab put it back in the box um Anyway, I, I just feel like also it's much more efficient when you're doing hangbacks, it's much more efficient when you're cleaning out dressing rooms, things like that. It doesn't limit you and make you spend extra money on different colored hangers for different kinds of things because also as, as I look through a store, if I see orange hangers, pink hangers, black hangers, white hangers, to me it just gets, it gets confusing. Oh my gosh, I go, I'm a big one on merchandising too. I love, I love the science of merchandising. So that I will, I will digress on all of that. But okay, let's see. Anything else? Yeah, we don't want anybody to feel segregated in a store. Not at all. Not at all. Okay, guys, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Let's see. If you guys have questions, um, I will drop the planner link in here. I will also drop the Retail Bootcamp course link in here. Like I said, it closes Friday. With that course, let me just tell you, I saw a question about it earlier. Retail Bootcamp is a 12-week course. You have lifetime access to it. Um, you will be invited to a VIP experience in LA in October, which is awesome. And I know a number of you are on here that went there last year. And y'all can go again, like I said, as far as lifetime access. You get literally lifetime access. That VIP experience, you get introduced to all sorts of awesome um, services, all sorts of awesome vendors. Um, you get brought in on a lot of really cool tours in LA, so that's awesome. 
But the course itself is very one-on-one. -on -one. Ashley and I go live in the community every week. We also bring in VIPs from the industry every week that talk over the modules, talk over strategy, talk over industry, um, what is happening, forecasting for the future. Really, Retail Bootcamp sets you in a stage to really excel and have privy information, honestly. But we deep dive into everything, team-based, management-wise, financial, inventory, content planning, social media, Google Ad Analytics, foundation of your business, mindset, all sorts of things, guys, it is deep. And it's 12 weeks, we take one week in the middle of it, so you do, you know, you do get a break, but you get emailed all the modules every week, you can work at your own pace, you can come back whenever you want, and, uh, Gosh, we've just heard excellent, awesome testimony. So um, actually, no, we don't do a sezzle payment plan, but we do offer a payment plan in-house with, with it. So you can break it up in payments, Angie. So yeah, wish you thought of the tabs. Prior. I know, Stacy, I hear you. Um, the tab thing, we did that and it was, it was awesome. We actually had petite for a little while too, and then we do just a, like the light blue tab on that. But um, anyway, it just made it more, it, it was much more efficient because I found um, getting in a bind like, oh my gosh, I still need more tab or more hangers or something for a product. But anyway, I my, again, I'm Sarah. My name is spelled without an H. So S-A-R-A at the boutique hub .com is my email. Friend me on Facebook, message me however you want to, if you want to chat. Um, part of the retail bootcamp course also is one-on-ones. If you do a VIP thing with Ashley and I, we do independent individual calls, two of them. We also do VIP uh, Zoom calls together, so that's awesome. But again, Retail Bootcamp has, is our signature course, 12 weeks, detailed modules, lifetime access. So if you're four years down the road and you wanna go back in and see our new updated version, which we update it all the time, you have access to that. All the videos from dating back to the first launch in 18, you have all the training videos there, all the expert videos there. You have you have access to all of those things from the day you get started. So it's a beautiful, beautiful course. Ashley and I, um, we love teaching it. We teach it twice a year, January we launch, and then, yep, there it is. Uh, that's, the, that's the link. January we launch, and then June we launch again. And October we take um, a group, invite to LA and that is awesome that is just such a it was so cool to watch all of that go down and all the relationships that were built with uh, the students and all the traction they were getting within their business and relationships they were making in LA with each other as well as the experts in the industry that are based in LA and just to hear now where they're at in their business versus where they were when they started and that is our goal with Retail Bootcamp, with the Boutique Hub in general. We want you to have the tools and education to take where your business is today and be 10 times more successful and more profitable in years to come. And the big goal here is understanding where your cash is, understanding how to pay yourself, pay your bills, be profitable, and be a business and not a hobby. And we deep dive into all of these things in Retail Bootcamp and more, and we invite you into the course. So again, it closes Friday. So when it's closed, it's closed, and we'll open it back up again in um, June. So when, when you do Retail Bootcamp, do you have membership to the Boutique Hub? Donna, um, retail Bootcamp is separate from um, membership into the Hub. Yep. All right. So yeah, you'll have, there'll be people in um, Bootcamp that you might not have known outside of the Hub, so. All right, if I can answer any other questions, you guys, let me know. I think we got them all. I can go back through and look. But you guys own those markdowns. Don't stress about them. You're gonna have them. Just learn from them, be aggressive in it, get that inventory turned into cash as fast as you can. And when you go to market next time, walk into that booth, be confident, ask the right questions, become the best investor of your inventory dollars that you possibly can, right? That'll reduce down on those markdowns. But. All right, guys, that's it. See you later.